What we're looking at on the screen is an ancient Hebrew conception of the universe. And what I would like to point out is the science behind how the ancient Hebrew explain the ocean tides. And if we pay attention to this model, we can see that the ancient Hebrew had our earth in a center of a sphere. And this would be the dielectric inertial plane in the middle of an electromagnetic torus field. And what we can see is the bottom half of this sphere is filled with water and the upper half is filled with air. This is basically how the ancient Hebrews saw our cosmos. And if you look at this, the bottom bowl would be full of ocean water and the top bowl would be full of the atmosphere or the gases that make up the atmosphere. And what we will have in the middle of this thing, we will have a churning mechanism that stirs them both at the same time directly from a central source, just like what we see in this image and this image. So if you can picture this churning coming from the center pyramid or the center diamond that we see here in the middle of the Taurus field, that diamond was considered to be a place called Mount Maru by the ancient people. And in the Hindu, they spoke about Vishnu churning the Milky Sea because our atmosphere is being spun around. So is the ocean water. And the mechanism that's responsible for the churning of our atmosphere and the churning of the sea lies at the core of our universe. And it is personified as this tree of life right here in the middle of the Mayan cosmology. This tree gives life because this churning of our atmosphere and the seas is what's responsible for renewing each day. The secrets of infinity is not to create more and you can't take away from infinity, but the secrets of infinity is a self perpetuating motion that allows things to constantly renew themselves and how that would look is just like this pattern right here, brothers and sisters. So each day is a new day, just like a wash machine. Every day is basically washed and recycled at the middle of our universe, and it becomes a new day. Now, the day is not any more newer than the set of clothes that I'm wearing once they become dirty and I put them in a wash cycle and I put it back on. So, but this is how the universe perpetuates its energy and recycles the elements while also maintaining a perpetual motion that will always bring forth self-healing when this thing is left in its undisturbed state. It's using the law of polarity as well because the top bowl is, is spinning a different direction than the bottom bowl. So if the top bowl is spinning clockwise, then the bottom bowl is spinning counterclockwise. And when you think about a globe earth, this is what they're trying to make the Coriolis effect on the globe earth. The root word of Coriolis is core. Core. When you mix the word Aurora Borealis with the word core, you get Coriolis or Coriolis effect. But what they're explaining is the effect that it spans from the core of our universe. And this effect is responsible for the churning of the ether. And since all of the states of matter and elements sits within this ether, once this ether is stirred, all of the elements within the universe are stirred. Just like when you stir water in a cup, the ice cubes will be stirred too because they're sitting within a medium. So everything in our universe is renewed, healed, and recycled at this core. And the word core is also synonymous with the word cure because the cure comes from within, from the core. And that's true even with human beings 
because just like the earth is an electromagnetic energy field here, so are we. But right now, I just want to talk about tides and how the ancient Hebrew explain the science of them. So again, all the water in the bottom of this thing, let's say it's rotating counterclockwise. And then the atmosphere above us will be rotating clockwise, okay? In the middle, you will have this pocket of vortex energy that's constantly renewing everything on our earth plane. Because the key is to not be stagnant and to keep things in motion. This causes an osmosis effect. An osmosis effect no different than an osmosis machine or a whirlpool water vortex where everything recycles around that vortex. Everything follows a motion pattern that makes it go in and out and around and around. So if you look at the shape of this vortex, it is the same idea of what's called the vault of heaven. And that's right here at the top of the electromagnetic energy field. That's what's responsible for the churning of the sky. And the bottom one is what's responsible for the churning of the sea. But they both are connected to the same pole. And the science of how this thing function can be seen right here. The spiral that's stirring up the matter inside of the top bowl is stirring it in a different direction in the bottom bowl. The secrets to all of this is as simple as contraction and expansion or inhale and exhale. If you observe the way that the human body inhales and exhales, and you compare that to the way that the oceans behave when you're at the beach, how the tides are coming in and out, this is the same inhale and exhale pattern. It's in and out and round and round. Simple as that. In and out and round and round. The ocean water is being stirred around in a circle, but it's also being pushed in and out, in and out. And isn't that the way that we observe it? You then push the field south, and by lowering the current, it flows back north again. It can also be pushed back and forth by an outside magnetic field from beyond the Antarctic. So basically what this clip is showing, how the magnetic field of the Earth inhales, it breathes in and out. In and out. You see this contraction and expansion. I also have another video by Eric Dubay that I'm going to play that's going to show you this same contraction and expansion in and out, just like we see the water at the beach doing. Also, here's another example of this reciprocation motion of the ether. And what we're looking at here is the same thing I just showed you. Over here. This little demonstration that you see is representing the motion that you see in this torus field right here. It's taking this white dotted spiral, which is churning through each of these bowls, and it's turning it into one 3D object and showing you how that motion would look in another way other than this one in a 3D animated sort of way. And you will get this reciprocation motion of the ether that we see here. So what flat earthers have done, they've outdone themselves with this field research. Here's the science of what our earth is. Our earth is a dielectric inertial plane that's capped in between two torus fields. And these two particular torus fields, based on the law of polarity, you have wet and dry, which is atmosphere and ocean, and they are churning in polarizing ways because when we're talking about a battery, the law of polarity is how we're creating energy. 
no different than man and woman making a child. So this is very, very advanced science that the ancient Hebrew was dealing with. And there were other cultures dealing with this science in their own ways. And just if you wanted to research this same science in another way, you can research something called the Orphic Egg and the Greek myth, particular Orphic thought, Fanes is the golden winged primordial being who was hatched from the shining cosmic egg that was the source of the universe. So this is representing the source of the universe or the force of the universe that I'm explaining. And here it is right here. So we can see that with the Orphic egg. Let's talk more about contraction and expansion. This is called an expanding sphere. And basically what this is showing you is everything I just showed you in this video. You see? Contraction and expansion. And again, this is an expanding sphere just to show you in a simple way, right, of what's, what the firmament dome is, what our universe is. It's alive, right? It's breathing, right? Our universe is alive and it's breathing just like me and you. And any kind of machine, anything that runs off of a motor will also vibrate. So not only is, is the matter within our universe being churned or spun around, all right, it's been contracted and expanded as well as all of that going on. The whole thing is vibrating. OK, so when you turn a car on, the faster that you go, the car starts to contract. And when you cut the car off, it expands. But also as the car is contracting and expanding, when the motor is running, it's vibrating. And we'll talk more about the vibratory principle after this next video that's going to show you more about the contraction and expansion that I'm telling you here that we see with the ocean tides, okay? All right, so just like the ocean tides coming in and out, they're all following the motion of the electromagnetic ether, all right? That's all going on. Contract, expand. In and out and round and round. The in and out is to contract and expand. The round and round represents the churning of it all. So let's watch this quick clip and then we're going to get into the vibratory aspect. Many cultures throughout history have recorded that located at the North Pole exists a large lodestone mountain surrounded by a massive whirlpool vortex which was claimed to cause the Earth's tides. This maelstrom allegedly reverses direction every six hours, alternately pulling in and pushing out the ocean waters, like the breath of Gaia at the naval center point of Earth, breathing in and out twice per day. If true, this explains the consistent regularity of high and low tides better than any other proposed theory. Ancient Norse legends state that a gigantic violent whirlpool known as Virgilmir, or the World's Well, surrounds the polar mountain, and via four six-hour daily cycles of pushing and pulling through subterranean channels, causes the rising and falling tides of Earth. Historical records of this deep abyss can be found as early as the 8th century AD, when Paulus Diaconus, or Paul the Deacon, wrote in his Historia Langobardorum that, quote, not far from the shore, where the ocean extends without bounds, is that very deep abyss of waters which we commonly call the ocean's navel. It is said twice a day to suck the waves into itself and to spew them out again, as is proved to happen along all these coasts, where the waves rush in and go back again with fearful rapidity. By the whirlpool of which we have spoken, it is asserted that ships are often drawn in with such rapidity that they seem to resemble the flight of arrows through the air, and sometimes they are lost in the gulf with a very frightful destruction. Often, just as they are about to go under, they are brought back again by a sudden shock of the waves, and they are sent out again, thence with the same rapidity with which they were drawn in. In 1035 AD, 
Phrygian explorer Adam of Bremen recounted his deadly encounter with this abysmal chasm in his book Gesta Hemerbergensis Ecclesiastae Pontificum, stating, quote, Of a sudden, they fell into that numbing ocean's dark mist, which could hardly be penetrated with the eyes. And behold, the current of the fluctuating ocean whirled back to its mysterious fountainhead, and with most furious impetuosity drew the unhappy sailors, who in their despair now thought only of death, on to chaos. This, they say, is the abysmal chasm, that deep in which report has it that all the backflow of the sea, which appears to decrease, is absorbed and in turn revomited, as the mounting fluctuation is usually described. So what Eric Dubé just described was the same contraction and expansion that I was trying to explain earlier. How this thing will swallow you in deep into a core and then just spit you back out again, just like we just described. It, it'll be like getting flushed down a toilet just for the toilet to vomit you back up again, you know, when the toilet overflows. So that, again, is showing you this same sort of contraction and expansion that our oceans are following. So in my theory, at the middle of our entire terrarium is exactly what me and Eric Dubé just explained, some sort of vortex suction that's not only spinning everything around, but contracting and expanding as it do so. Now let's talk about the vibratory aspect, because when we talk about our universe, cymatics is everything with what we're teaching right now about the electromagnetic energy field that all states of matter sit within. So a lot of ancient people talked about how Earth is vibrating at a certain frequency. And a lot of modern scientists, when we go to talking about vibration and cymatics, they like to write it off as tinfoil hat pseudoscience talk that doesn't deserve any attention. But if our Earth is indeed vibrating, there's one way we could find out. And here's one way that I found out. If you look at water inside of a bathtub, if you look at the surface pattern of the water, it is smooth. All right. There's no lumps. There's no textures. When water is settled in a bathtub, it's smooth. The surface of the water is level and the pattern is smooth. But when we go to the ocean, the oceans don't have a smooth pattern. They have this sort of rigid pattern that I'm going to zoom in. We're going to examine here. When you look at the surface of the ocean water, it's not like what I just showed you with the bathtub. The surface of this bathtub water is, is smooth like glass, right? It's smooth like glass. And when we look at the oceans, we get this rigid sort of wrinkly pattern. As opposed to this, we get this sort of, you know, carpet texture, if you will, as opposed to this, right? We get this. And this pattern, actually, if we can step out of our small human bodies and look at the earth on a gigantic scale, this pattern actually represents the vibrational energy of the earth influencing the water that we call ocean water. Check it out. Here is what water looks like when it's being vibrated. Here is what water looked like when the water is sitting upon something that's vibrating. All right? Here is what water looks like when the water is sitting upon something that's vibrating. Pay attention to the pattern. Now let's go back to the ocean water. Same pattern. We're inside of a living being. And not only is it breathing, all of the elements inside of this thing is being stirred up just like the elements in your body. 
So all of the fluids and, 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 and different things inside of your body is constantly circulating around the spinal cord while the body is contracting and expanding. All of the laws that I've taught in this video, your body is following it too. So when we talk about the earth vibrating, one way we can prove that is with the texture of the ocean water. And the reason why the bathtub don't have that texture, okay, because all of the land that we're on is separate from that part of the earth. And it's on the immovable foundations of the earth. And that explains why the bathtub don't have ocean tides either. If the moon was causing the ocean tides, like they say on a globe, then people at the beach with a cup of water will have tides in their water. If I got a swimming pool next to the ocean, then the water in my swimming pool should behave like the ocean water. If we're saying it's the gravitational pull of the moon, unless we're also going to say that gravity is selective and it only chooses to affect large bodies of water and not small ones. And I know that's the cop out that we're going to get from you guys, which is. Again, people, we know that the earth is vibrating because of the pattern that's on all of the oceans around the world. All right. It resembles the same pattern that water should resemble if it has settled within a container that is indeed vibrating like the ancestors said our beautiful earth is. Flat MF power to everybody that watched this video. Let's get it, baby.